it's a pleasure today uh, to welcome Steve Allen um, for this uh, colloquium. Um, Steve did his graduate work at the University of Cambridge uh, with Andy Fabian as his advisor. He then spent um, about another decade in that Cambridge working. Long time, yeah. Long time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, before he joined the, the faculty at uh, Stanford University. Uh, he also holds a, uh, a visiting professorship now. Um, let me get this right. He is the Sophie and Tycho Brahe Visiting Professor in the Dark Cosmology Center at the University of Copenhagen. Um, Steve, <laughs> yeah, that's cool, isn't that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, he's one of the leading researchers in the field of clusters of galaxies. He uses um, lots of X-ray observations as well as HST and others to study them. In fact, I, I looked up, he uses probably all currently operating X-ray satellites. and. If I've done the arithmetic right, he has um, used nearly four million seconds of Chandra time. Do you really want to bad. say that? <laughs> what? <laughs> put, to, put to reasonable use, I, I trust. I'll, I'll, I'll put to Thank good you, use. In, in fact, he's going to tell us about some of that use today. Um, his talk is Galaxy Clusters and the Dark Universe. Okay, there thanks. You go. Thanks, Christine. Four million seconds. Gosh, I'd never added that up. Um, Okay, so, so indeed, that's my, my title. Uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, give you a very quick, you know, we've got an hour here, a very quick overview of where we stand today in cluster cosmology, uh, the latest results, challenges, uh, opportunities. But what I'd really like to do today is showcase a whole bunch of brand new results that we've just unblinded in some cases, really just unblinded. Um, they're the result of, best guess, something like a cumulative 30 years of work by this group of people listed here. Uh, in particular, I'd like to, to highlight just three complete heroes of this work. And if credit is due, it's due to, to these three. In particular, and especially Adam Mance, who's the lead of all the cosmology results that I'm going to show you, and was also the lead of most of the X-ray analysis. And then Doug Applegate, who's here in the audience. Doug, raise your hand, please. Thank you. And Anya von der Linden, who've been our joint leads of a large, weak lensing effort that has also been critical to this work. Uh, so as I say, a lot of this stuff will be new. A lot of it will be the first time I've talked about it, which made it more fun for me to come here and do this. But there will be some raw edges. OK, a few uh, words of introduction. So as you all know, galaxy clusters are the largest objects in the universe. These are vast, rare concentrations of baryons and dark matter pulled together by gravity, and these things are still continuing to grow today, to get bigger. Now, the reason that we can use clusters to probe cosmology is that we're able to predict, at least statistically, and as a function of cosmological parameters, both what the internal structure of galaxy clusters should look like and how these things should be distributed across the sky and out in redshift, and then compare those predictions as a function of cosmological parameters to what we actually see. And as you'll see in doing so, we're able to get very powerful constraints on things like dark energy, gravity, even neutrino masses, and inflation. And I'll talk about some of that stuff here today. So here's a quick outline of my talk. There are basically two main ways with which you can constrain cosmology with galaxy clusters, and I'll talk about them both. The first method uh, uses measurements of the baryonic mass fraction in the largest dynamically relaxed galaxy clusters. This test is also known as the F-gas test. And when you do this, you're doing cosmology with cherry-picked cluster samples, a little bit like working uh, with type 1a supernovae. So <laughs> you, should, you should feel proud. You should feel very proud. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and like, like supernovae 1A, this method primarily constrains dark energy through measurements of the expansion history. So we'll talk about that one first. Secondly, I'll also talk about constraints from cluster counts, where in that case we're doing cosmology with complete cluster samples, in particular using measurements of the mass function, the number density of clusters as a function of mass and as a function of redshift. And these techniques, as you'll see, also provide us with constraints on dark energy, but in this case from both the expansion and growth histories of the universe together. And then at the end of the talk, I'll talk about 
just a little bit about the prospects for improvements beyond what you'll see today with new cluster surveys. So that's the outline. Let's get started. And first up, we're going to talk about the F-gas test. Um, so the featured work here is led by, led by Adam. Uh, uh, we unblinded this one in the summer, and the paper should be submitted by Christmas. So this stuff is uh, just about complete. OK, so let's start by discussing how this test works. It's very simple. Everyone here will get it straight away if I explain it. The basic idea is that galaxy clusters are so big that their matter content should provide an approximately fair sample of the matter content of the universe as a whole. Think of these things as giant buckets out there in space that always scoop up the same fractional amount of normal baryonic matter and dark matter. The key measurement that you need to make if you want to use this to do cosmology is to measure the F, the, is to measure F gas, the gas mass fraction in the cluster. That's the mass of the X-ray emitting gas as a fraction of the total mass. The reason it's so important is that the X-ray gas completely dominates the baryonic mass. So if you measure this, you've essentially measured uh, the baryonic mass fraction. Now, since the X-ray emitting gas dominates the baryonic mass, and since galaxy clusters provide approximately fair samples of the matter content of the universe, you can straightforwardly see that you can write down a relation that the gas mass fraction in the cluster should be equal to the average baryon uh, fraction for the universe as a whole, omega b divided by omega m, modified only by a depletion uh, parameter that we'll call y, that should have a value of pretty close to 1 for these big clusters. So what you can see is that if you know what your depletion factor is, uh, and there you'll need to rely on hydrodynamical simulations, and if you know what omega b is, you have a prior on that, and we do from Big Bang Nucleosynthesis or the CMB, then in that case, measurements of the gas mass fraction from your X-ray data will give you omega matter. OK, very simple argument. Try to keep this simple equation with you if you can. You, you can see from this, it's obvious that measurements of the gas mass fraction will be critical to what we do here. Before we talk about the measurements, though, let's just talk briefly about the data that we would ideally like to work with to do this experiment. And if you could get what you wish for, you'd want Chandra data, the best X-ray data you can get, for all of the largest, most dynamically relaxed clusters that you can find in the universe. If you study those clusters, the advantage is that you will minimize all of the systematic uncertainties in this experiment. You won't completely eradicate them, and you'll still need to account for the residual uncertainties, but you'll minimize them by design. So that's what we've done. We've gone out and we searched the Chandra archive, as it was at the start of this year, for all of the really big, that's temperature greater than 5 kV, most dynamically relaxed clusters that existed on the archive. In identifying the most relaxed systems, you're doing that purely based on X-ray morphology, using an automated algorithm that's looking at attributes such as the peakiness of the X-ray emission and high levels of symmetry, minimal isophote centroid shifts, those three things in particular. And if you use those together, it's a very effective way of identifying the most relaxed systems. Here's just an example of three of them that it picks out. So when we do that, we put in the thresholds for what we say are the really relaxed things. We end up with 40 of these systems spanning a redshift range of, uh, between naught and just over one. So these are the observations that we'll be working with for this test. As I said, the key thing to measure here is the gas mass fraction. So let's look at those measurements. So what I'm showing here are the differential F gas measurements as a function of overdensity with respect to, uh, respect to critical. So radius is increasing as we come this way toward the right. And here we've got the results for all 40 clusters. As I said, these are differential profiles. So when you look at the gas mass fraction here, it is the value here, not the integrated quantity. Couple of notes about the analysis. For the experts in the room, our analysis uses the standard assumptions that you would use uh, in such an analysis of spherical symmetry and hydrostatic equilibrium. We also assume that the mass profiles can be modeled with NFW profiles, which is a good, sound assumption. Otherwise, the analysis is completely non-parametric. In particular, there are no assumptions here about particular forms for the temperature or density profiles of the gas. So this is really the minimal and I would say best justified set of assumptions that you could use if you wanted 
to do this type of analysis. Now, it's rather difficult to see what's going on when you have all 40 profiles lying one on top of each other there. So let me thin that out and show just the profiles for the 12 lowest redshift clusters. And now you can better see what's going on. So again, differential F gas is a function of lower density. So what you can see here, firstly, is that the profiles rise as a function of radius. You can see that at low radius, there's quite a lot of intrinsic scatter here in the data. But by the time you get out to R2500 or so, the profiles are pretty much lying on top of each other. <laughs> now, if you want to do cosmology with measurements like these, you're free to use any part of the data that you would like to. And what you want to do if you want to get your best cosmology measurements is work with data where the intrinsic scatter is minimal, but where you've still got good statistical precision in your measurements. And when you look at these data and you want minimal scatter but still good precision, you pick a radius where you'd like to work, and we decided to work here. Around R2500, because it's a nice round number that people are familiar with, and it satisfies the criteria. And in detail, we decided to work in a shell that goes between 0.8 and 1.2 R2500. And if we make our measurement of the gas mass fraction in this shell, uh, for these 12 clusters, you can see we get a mean value of about 12.5% with a very high precision on that measurement. So here's our uh, F-gas measurements for these uh, low redshift clusters. Now, surprisingly, perhaps, figuring out that one should work in a shell here to minimize the scatter whilst maintaining good precision, rather than use all of the data out of this radius or beyond, is a new thing. It took us until now to figure out that this was a smart thing to do. It's really, really obvious once I've explained it, but it's a step forward. The other really important reason that it's advantageous to work in a shell, though, rather than a sphere from the center out to that radius, is that it massively simplifies the prediction of the depletion parameter from hydrodynamic simulations. In the centers of the clusters, where you have lots of gas cooling, lots of AGN activity, lots of star formation, it's actually very difficult to predict that depletion parameter, the ratio of baryons in the cluster to the universal value. However, if you step away from the center and come out to a radius such as the one we're working with, it becomes relatively very straightforward. Here I'm just showing an example of one of the latest uh, sets of um, uh, state-of-the-art hydro simulations here in this red curve from Battaglia et al. In blue, um, it's the Chandra data I just showed you. The mean value for all uh, 40 clusters and the 25 and uh, 95, excuse me, 68 and 95 percent uh, confidence limits. And you can see that the predictions from simulations overlap remarkably well with the data when we're out here at R2500, our measurement shell. And that's without any tweaking whatsoever. There's been no rescaling or anything. That's just how good it looks straight away. So, as I say, working out here in a shell, a lot simpler than trying to integrate over this. So to get our depletion parameter, we just go to the simulations, and we read off what the depletion parameter is uh, in our shell. There are two state-of-the-art uh, sets of simulations that are out there. To get our mean value, we just take the mean of those two sets of simulations. To get our error bar, we look at the spread between those simulations and double that spread. Okay, so that's where this number comes from. So, with this value for the depletion parameter, the value for F gas that I just showed you before, if you remember that simple equation, you'll recall that we're in position that we could, if we wanted to, go ahead and work out what omega matter is. But we're going to hold off on that for now because there's more information that's present in the data. And that information will allow us to refine the constraint on omega matter, but more interestingly, will also allow us to start to probe dark energy. And that information comes from the fact that when you take your X-ray data, a set of spectra and brightness information, and convert it into a gas mass fraction measurement, that measurement has a distance dependence in it. F gas is proportional to distance to the 1.5 power. And it's that distance as a function of redshift information that gives you a constraint on dark energy. Okay? In order to access that information, of course, you need to know what you should expect to see in terms of F gas as a function of redshift. And what you expect to see is that F gas should be constant as a function of redshift. 
Intuitively, that's really obvious. It's because whatever redshift you look at, these big clusters are providing fair samples of the matter content of the universe as a whole. So this is a standard quantity that you expect clusters to have. So here's our expectation. F gas should be constant as a function of redshift, as backed up by the simulations. Again here, in order to get our prior on the evolution of the depletion parameter, we just parameterized in this simple way, we went to the simulations, we looked at the evolution in them, we took the mean value, we looked at the uncertainty in that e evolution, the spread between them, and then just doubled it again. <coughs> so that's where we got this prior that we're going to use on the uncertainty of the evolution of the depletion parameter. Okay, the expectation is F gas should be flat as a function of redshift. That means if you want to test, say, two trial cosmologies and you've got some F-gas data, you can just assume those two different trial cosmologies, measure F-gas, and see which of the two trial cosmologies looks flatter in terms of F-gas as a function of redshift. And the one that's flatter is the better cosmology. Here's an example of doing that on the left for SCDM, omega matter one, no dark energy, and on the right a standard lambda CDM universe, and it doesn't take long to look at this and see that the plot on the right looks better than the one on the left. This is the preferred cosmological model. If you want to find your best fit cosmology, you could kind of imagine doing this for loads of different trial cosmologies, seeing which one looks the flattest. That would work. It's not the best thing to do, though. Far more elegant is to take either one of these data sets or, or one like them and just fit that reference data set with a model that accounts for the expected variation of F-gas as a function of redshift as you change your trial cosmology. The model that you would need to fit to that reference data set would look something like this. Uh, here's that distance dependence I was talking about before to the 1.5 power. And here's just the same simple equation I showed you before, uh, just with an additional parameter k, which is a calibration uh, uh, parameter, which I'll talk about in a few minutes' time. But it's a very simple model. Intuitively, again, you can see that the shape of this curve coming from this uh, factor here, the shape of the curve is what gives us our information on dark energy, whereas the normalization of the curve gives us an additional constraint on omega matter. Right, now, before we look at any results, I want to talk about systematic uncertainties, because every result that I show you here today will be fully marginalized over a conservative set of systematic uncertainties. And for this experiment, the uncertainties come in two main places. The first of which is that depletion, is that prediction of the depletion parameter, which I've already talked about. I've told you how we got these priors. The second main set of systematic uncertainties are the tricky ones. Those are the uncertainties that are associated with the accuracy of the hydrostatic mass measurements that you made with your Chandra data. Because although these are the most relaxed clusters that we can find in the universe, uh, they're not perfectly relaxed. There will be some residual non-thermal pressure support in them. And although Chandra is a, is a great satellite and an enormous amount of work went into the calibration of it, that calibration is not perfect. And that will impact on the accuracy of the measurements. So how do we deal with this? Here's where I need to take an aside. And in this aside, which will last about five minutes, I'm going to represent the 25 years or so of accumulated work that went in from Doug and colleagues using weak gravitational lensing data. If anyone is interested in the details of this, you can check out these three papers at your leisure, which are all now in press, uh, which will tell you exactly what we did. But let me very quickly run through the motivation and a couple of the results. So, without question, the primary limitation of current cluster cosmology and the main challenge, the big challenge we have for all cluster cosmology looking ahead, lies in the calibration of cluster masses. How accurately can we measure the masses of clusters? Every single published analysis that's out there on cluster cosmology should have been marginalized over a systematic uncertainty in the absolute mass calibration of at least 15%. That wasn't always the case, but it should have been done. That's the best it could have been before now. With the new generation of surveys, cluster surveys that are going out there, we absolutely have to reach a mass calibration accuracy of 5% if we even want to do the most basic thing that does justice to those surveys. And really we want to be at 2% or ideally 1% to take advantage of those surveys. 
How do we do that? There's only one way that I'm aware of that we can do it, and that's using weak gravitational lensing techniques. So what we started out doing five or so years ago was developing techniques to try to give us accurate weak lensing masses from clusters with a big eye toward LSST, which is a big project for those of us out there on the West Coast, um, but also with the intention of applying these techniques as soon as we could to current data so that we could take advantage of them and do better than this 15% that we'd been at. And so what we did, having developed the techniques, is apply them to deep Subaru imaging. This is very high quality uh, data, the closest thing you can get to LSST. Deep imaging, about R25, 0.6 R seconds seeing, uh, aiming for five filters uh, for 50 massive clusters. Okay, previously, I think it's fair to say, uh, it's perhaps generous to say that the accuracy of previous weak lensing studies in the literature had not been rigorously established. Okay, there was a lot of guesswork. It, that, that work was kind of in a pioneer, it's fair to say, it's in a pioneering mode. Determining the accuracy was not a priority for those studies. And additionally, those studies, rather than working with a super high quality five filter imaging, it was working with maybe one filter, maybe two, uh, and using uh, small reference fields to calibrate the mass uh, redshift relations. So, to address this first concern, because what we really want here is to understand the accuracy of our measurements and take advantage of LSST-like data, uh, we developed a new technique for measuring uh, masses of clusters uh, using shear data, which takes full advantage or f fuller advantage of the information that's present in high-quality imaging data like these. In particular, taking advantage of the exquisite photometry that you get if you, if you try your very best to get really accurate photometry, in that we use the individual photometric redshift information, the full posterior of the P of Z information for every single lens galaxy in those galaxy clusters. And doing that turns out to be a really good thing to do. Using this method, we've also been able to rigorously establish just how well it works, how accurate it, it works. We've done that against a whole suite of simulation results and also taking full advantage of the Cosmos field, which fortunately has beautiful 30-filter uh, narrowband imaging and a whole bunch of spectroscopy, which allowed us to, to really put this thing through the, rigor, uh, through the ringer. Only when we completed all those tests and we'd established the accuracy of the technique did we apply the technique blindly to the job of measuring the cluster masses for the clusters in our sample. So that's what we did. I've got just a couple of, of slides here that it would be far better if Doug than I talk, but I'm up here, so I'll, I'll talk about them, Doug, just showing a couple of examples about how well the technique is performing. So here I'm showing the results of, of an idealized test in the sense that we're measuring the fractional mass bias that we get with this lensing technique as a function of cluster redshift for idealized clusters in the sense that these clusters are perfect NFW models put out there in space with background galaxies that are drawn from the cosmos field where we know the redshifts of those galaxies we then just take the five filters that we're working with here and see how well we can recover the masses of the clusters and the most important result here is that the mean mass that we recover from these simulations with this technique is good to about one percent accuracy and moreover has no significant redshift dependent trend in it that's really, really good, and it's so stable. You can, of course, then calibrate out that 1% if you want, but even without calibration, just taking it raw, it's working accurate to 1%. This is using the full P of Z information, as I say, for every single one of those background galaxies. You may well ask, well, what if you just use point estimators for the um, photo Zs instead of the full P of Z? Would it work as well? And the answer is no, it wouldn't work as well. It would work nowhere near as well. In blue, we've got the results, or gray, of, of taking the full P of Z information. And in red is what you get if you just use a point estimator, the typical thing you'd read out of BPZ or something for what the redshift of that background galaxy is. And you can see if you do that, you get significant redshift-dependent trends in the data at the 5% level or worse. So that's not good. You wouldn't want to have that. Remember, the accuracy we're trying to get to is ideally a few percent eventually in, in mass. So this technique, this POC technique, is, is really performing very well. Uh, 
So not to belabor the, belabor the point, let me just run to this final conclusion slide about uh, this technique and how well it does and its, and its limitations, where we need to make progress. So the bottom line is, using this technique and with the 51 clusters that we have, 27 of which have the full five filters, the worst case we have three filters, we achieve a mass calibration accuracy of 7%. So that's twice as good as the best that existed before. It's a really significant step forward. What are the main limitations? Now, how can we do better than this? The main limitations currently lie in three places. One, we're still using the step simulations to calibrate between measured shear and true shear in the cluster. That's one of the biggest sources of uncertainty that's here because the step simulations are just not big enough and working in quite the shear regime that we'd like. Secondly, there's an uncertainty associated with the fact that we assume an NFW model when we measure the shear of the clusters. That's a good thing to do. It's as good as anything else. But in translating that shear that you measure with that NFW model, there's a residual uncertainty that comes in, which is at the 3% right uh, level right now. And then finally, it's just root n statistics. The fact that we only have 51 clusters is giving us a root n issue here which is limiting us to the 4% level. Put those together and you've got your 7%. So we're working really hard to improve these. These first two things, we can improve straightforwardly with simulations and efforts to do that are underway within the LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration. These are the two top goals for that collaboration in the cluster group. And the root end statistics we're working on by just trying to expand the number of clusters within what we inventively call weighing the giants too. Okay. So with that, talking about uh, th that issue about cluster mass calibration, I'm going to end that aside, return to where we were. Remember, trying to extract cosmological constraints from the gas mass fraction data. We said this was the big problematic set of uncertainties. And now this, these uncertainties are informed directly by this weighing the giants study that I just described. Here, remember, we're only working with the most dynamically relaxed clusters, so we can only use those weighing the giants clusters that are also in the F-gas sample, but 12 of them are. If we want to turn this information, in detail we use the information in its entirety, accounting properly for how things vary as you change the background cosmology, etc. But if you just want to turn it into a number that you can keep in mind for what this means, this calibration factor, in terms of adjusting the Chandra masses, the value is 0.9 plus or minus. Okay, with that, let's move on to look at the results. So marginalizing over all of those systematic uncertainties that I've talked about and in the, uh, using this model and in the first case looking at results for a lambda CDM cosmology. That, so this isn't flat, curvature is a free parameter. We get these results here. Oh, I should also say we're using standard priors here on uh, omega BH squared and the Hubble constant. So here are the results, 68% and 95% confidence limits. And here are the marginalized constraints, omega matter 0.29 plus or minus 0.04, omega lambda 0.65 plus or minus 0.19 from these F-gas data alone. It's interesting to ask what's limiting these constraints. This constraint on omega matter is completely limited by that weak lensing mass calibration. The X-ray data have exquisite precision. It's all to do with that calibration. If we get more weak lensing data of that quality, put it through uh, the same pipeline, this thing, this constraint will shrink straight away. It's only that. Whereas this constraint on dark energy is entirely limited by the Chandra data. It's not systematics at all. If we find more big relaxed clusters and go and get Chandra data for them, it's straightforward to improve that constraint. It may be interesting just to show how this constraint, the one we just got, compares to the previous state of the art, which immodestly was, was from our group as well. And you can, you can see the difference. At first glance, you look at it and you say, well, oh, that improvement looks kind of modest to me. Um, the constraint on omega matter is a bit tighter. The constraints on dark energy are about the same as they were before. And that's just because we didn't put any more, well, hardly any more new clusters into this. The surveys haven't gone out and found them yet. They exist in the universe. There are loads of them out there but existing surveys haven't found them yet. 
The big step forward really with this is that we've dramatically lowered the systematic floor for this experiment. Those three main advances, using an automated selection for the clusters rather than by eye, working in a shell rather than a sphere, and having the lensing data to calibrate the masses has lowered that systematic floor and offered a, a, a route, a clear route, to lowering it, lowering it even further. And there's absolutely nothing standing in our way of improving these constraints by factors of five or 10 or more by the end of this decade, so long as Chandra stays healthy and we go out there and follow up the new clusters that we find in the surveys that are happening right now. Okay, let me show you how the constraints compare with others that are out there. So here's the F gas in red. Uh, BAO with the same omega B8 squared Hubble constant priors in brown. Green is supernovae, that's the Union 2.1. And uh, CMB here is WMAP plus SPT plus ACT. The nice thing is you can see the constraints all overlap. It's 68% confidence. That may encourage you to want to combine them. That's not obviously a wrong thing to do. If you do combine them, you get this little gold thing here in the center. And the marginalized constraints uh, for the gold contour combining everything together are shown here. Omega matter 0.29, omega lambda 0.71, consistent with a flat universe. Uh, the one last thing I'll mention is that when you combine with CMB, neither the BAO or F gas data then need the external priors on omega B8 squared and the Hubble constant because the CMB has everything you need in that case. Curvature is a free parameter, yes. Okay, so that's for lambda CDM. This figure is for flat WCDM now for a constant W dark energy model. Again, in red, F gas, brown BAO, green supernova, blue CMB. They all overlap at 68%. You can feel confident about combining them. If you do, you get the results that are shown here, consistent with a cosmological constant, i.e. consistent with minus one, with an error bar of about point, well, of 0.08. The only point uh, that I want to emphasize here to go with this is you'll notice how the constraints from the gas, F gas data give you this nice tight constraint on omega matter, which remember is primarily coming from just the normalization of that F gas curve. And the nice thing about this experiment is as you go to ever more complicated dark energy models, I won't show you any more here, but you could do many different types of evolving model, that constraint on omega matter won't get much worse. It's just a feature of this technique that it always locks down omega matter. So if you're someone who likes playing with different cosmological data sets to explore different models, think about this data set if you find yourself wanting something to lock down omega matter. One last point that I want to make on this experiment, and that is about the low systematic scatter in the F gas data. The scatter, the intrinsic scatter in these data is really remarkably small. It's 7.4 plus or minus 2.3%, which translates to a scatter in the distance estimates to these clusters of just under 5%. That means that F gas gives you a very precise tracer of the expansion history of the universe, as good as the very best supernova data you might think of getting. Interestingly, the scatter that we measure is in very good agreement, even though it comes out of a blind analysis, it's in very good agreement with what you predict should be there from hydrodynamical simulations, again, looking in this shell. And interestingly, again, the prediction from those simulations is that scatter should be mostly due to residual gas motions, turbulent and bulk motions that are in the gas and are affecting the hydrostatic support. That's interesting because very soon, Less than two years from now, we'll have a new satellite, Astro-H, that will be able to measure those gas motions directly, at least for nearby clusters. And if indeed it's the case that these gas motions are responsible for that scatter, or a large part of it, by measuring those motions, you can see that you would, in principle, be able to correct for them and reduce the scatter even further, which would be a very nice thing to do. The second point that I want to make about this low scatter is a very, very basic point. And it's just that what this low scatter tells you is that if you measure M gas, the gas mass, which is very easy to do, no matter what the dynamical state of the cluster is, if you measure M gas, you know what the total mass is. That's what a low scatter in this fraction means. It means if you measure M gas, 
you know what the total mass is. And M gas is easy to measure, as I say, no matter what the dynamical state of the cluster is. And that, as you'll see, will be very important for the next part of my talk. So that's it. We finished with the first experiment, the F gas experiment. Now we're going to talk about constraints from cluster counts. This work is the extremely new stuff. In fact, I wondered, I talked with Adam, should we even talk, shall I talk about this here? Because we unblinded this analysis last week. And we looked at it, and of course the chains, not all of the chains, are fully converged. And so I'm not going to show you anything that we don't think is at least trustworthy to do it. But the analysis is locked in place, and these are the constraints that come out, with it, come out from it. And they're new, and it's fun to come here and talk about new things. So here you go. Firstly, let's just talk about how the experiment works. So we've known for several, three decades at least now, that in principle, measurements of the number counts of galaxy clusters as a function of mass and a function of redshift should provide us with very powerful constraints on cosmology, including dark energy. And, and that's illustrated very nicely by this old figure by Stefano Borgani, where he's showing the normalized mass function of clusters, so the number density of clusters above a given threshold mass as a function of redshift for three different reference cosmologies. SCDM, omega matter uh, of one, uh, standard lambda CDM, and, and an open universe with the same value of omega matter. And what you can see very clearly from this figure is that if you lock down the number density of clusters at low redshift, which we've done, you then have enormous potential discriminating power by measuring the evolution of the number density of clusters. If you just look out here at a redshift of 0.7 or so, if you've locked down the behavior at redshift zero, you can see that for an omega matter of one universe versus a lambda CDM universe, you're talking about a predicted difference in the number density of clusters of a factor, a factor of 100. Even for the same omega matter and looking at with and without dark energy, you're talking about factors of a few difference in the predicted number density of clusters. And you can see very quickly then that if you have samples of even tens of clusters or hundreds of clusters, there's enormous discriminating power that's available to you. So that's the technique that we're going to use here. So it's completely independent, as I say, from the previous experiment. This is with complete samples of clusters. Okay, there are three things that you need if you want to do this. The first thing you need is the predicted number density of clusters from theory, n of m of z, as a function of your cosmological parameters of interest. The good news, at least for current analyses, is that that's done well enough to deal with current cluster data sets. However, there's work to do to utilize the new surveys that are coming, which I'll talk about soon. Second thing you need obviously, is your cluster survey. You want, ideally, a large, very clean, totally complete cluster survey with, critically, a very well-defined selection function. Currently, the leading work is based on X-ray surveys drawn from ROSAT, 20 years old but still leading the way, optical surveys from SDSS, and uh, more recently, millimeter wave surveys utilizing the SZ effect in clusters. Our group has really led the way in using X-ray surveys based on the ROSAT All Sky survey. Uh, there were three surveys that were constructed from the ROSAT All Sky survey that are useful for cosmology, one of which was done by our group, the brightest cluster sample. That was at low redshifts in the northern sky. In the southern sky, the counterpart was the reflex survey led by MPE. And then there was the bright max survey that did both north and south, just extending out to slightly higher redshifts extracting the last drops of information from the Rice Adol Sky survey. So we've used these surveys, luminosity versus redshift for those surveys as shown here, to keep systematic uncertainties to a minimum. We've used conservative flux limits for the surveys and limit our, limited our analysis to only the most luminous things in this region here above the dashed line. So in total, that gives us 224 clusters in this survey. But 224 clusters, as you'll see, will be plenty to do what we want to do. Okay, the third critical ingredient to do this experiment is a scaling relation or scaling relations. You want ideally tight, well-determined scaling relations linking your survey observable, which for an X-ray survey would be X-ray luminosity, 
and mass. And this is the hard bit. This is the tricky bit. So what you want to do when you're building your scaling relation is build as accurately and precisely as you can the statistical relationship between your survey observable on this side and mass on the other side. Now, unfortunately, there's no single direct way to go between survey observable and mass that is both accurate and precise. Okay, it's not accurate in the mean and have a low intrinsic scatter. If you take something like weak lensing, it is, as I said, it's great in terms of being accurate. It will give you the mean mass to very good accuracy. But weak lensing masses for clusters are individually very imprecise, a scatter of maybe 30% or so. And that scatter, intrinsic scatter of 30%, is going to mess with your cosmological parameters. It's going to weaken them significantly if you just accept that and go with it. But there's something better than that that you can do. The smart thing to do is put an intermediate step there in the center and measure things that we call mass proxies. And good mass proxies are quantities that are easy to measure in the first place and correlate very tightly with mass in a way that has minimal intrinsic scatter. So you give yourself this intermediate step where you've got your survey observable, you've got your mass proxy, it's very easy to measure the mass proxy, and you know that that mass proxy has a tight relationship with mass, and you can calibrate the absolute accuracy of that relationship with your weak lensing data. Got it? It's that two-step process. The data that you need to make it work then are firstly good mass proxy information. And when it comes to tight, low scatter mass proxies, x-rays are king. Okay, X-rays are the only way to go for doing that. I've already talked about the best mass proxy to work with these big clusters, which is just the gas mass. I showed you it correlates really tightly with mass. But also we can measure temperature and yx, which is just the uh, product of these two. These are all three very good tight mass proxies that give you that low scatter relationship with mass. And we then calibrate the absolute mass accuracy with that weak lensing, those weak lensing data from the weighing the giants program, those 51 weak lensing masses. So that's the information together that's going to handle the scaling relations for us. Okay, before we get to the results, just a word about the analysis, because this was something that took a big step forward uh, a few years ago, and Adam Mance deserves a lot of credit for this. Uh, to really determine robust cosmological constraints from uh, data like these, you need to solve simultaneously for all of the cosmological parameters and astrophysical parameters of interest, while simultaneously accounting fully for survey biases, those are important uh, for flux-limited surveys like these, and marginalizing over all the uncertainties that you need to marginalize over. Um, this isn't trivial to do. Um, well, you know, the frame, statistical framework now exists, so it's trivial to to use it now, but still it takes quite a lot of computing power to do it properly. Uh, it's something you can do efficiently with MCMC methods, but you still need decent computing behind you uh, to do it. Not a problem for people here or, or out in Slack, but it's not something you can do on your desktop. So that's the analysis. Um, systematics. So again, every result that I'm going to show you will be marginalized over what we believe to be a conservative set of systematic uncertainties. These will be associated with those three main areas I discussed, the theoretical predictions of the mass function, uh, the completeness of the survey, and, and in particular with the scaling relations that we're working with. Um, however, still, I, I went into details about the Wayne the Giants program, still at the bottom line of this is that the dominant systematic uncertainty that will affect these results will remain the uncertainty in the absolute mass calibration of the clusters, which is now 7%. A lot better than 15%, but it's still the limitation. I should also mention that the constraints that we show will again use those standard priors on the Hubble constant and omega bh squared. So with that, let's move to the new results. So as I say, these were unblinded on Friday, um, and here you go. It's the first time we've talked about them. I don't think even Doug has seen all of these before. So firstly, results on sigma 8, the amplitude of fluctuations uh, versus the mean matter density, 68 and 95% confidence limits. Uh, results from clusters only, 
uh, marginalize over all the systematics, omega matter 0.26 plus or minus 0.03, sigma 8 0.83 plus or minus 0.04. Um, should you be excited by those numbers? It depends how familiar with those numbers you are and what they mean in context. I'm excited by those numbers. I'll, I'll show you why over the next few slides. Firstly, though, we're pleased because this is just comparing the new results to where we were before. Before, we were limited by 15% uncertainty in the mass calibration. Now, now it's down to 7. And you can see what a difference it makes in, in these parameters here. We've shrunk the area of this, these ellipses down by a factor of 2 or so. Remember, the big, the big change here is the introduction of the weighing the giant's mass calibration, although we've also updated to the, to the latest um, Chandra calibration. Significant improvement with respect to where we are. Uh, we're not the only people who've, who've measured these constraints, sigma 8 and omega matter. Here are just a, a couple of results from other groups. Um, I've picked the most, most different ones I could come up with. So here, results from Rosso et al. using clusters selected at optical wavelengths from the SDSS. And here, results from Benson et al. using clusters selected at millimeter wavelengths using the SE effect. And the bottom line is that the results from these groups are consistent with those I just showed you. The confidence contours overlap with each other at the one sigma level. The same is also true for the very nice work done here by Alexei Vaklinin and, and colleagues using X-ray selected surveys, uh, X-ray selected clusters, but selected in a completely different way, not using the RAS, but from pointed observations. Again, the results overlap very well uh, with the ones that I just presented. This is interesting for a number of reasons, in particular because the studies by other groups here are not using weak lensing primarily to calibrate their masses, but are using Chandra X-ray measurements. So that wasn't, that wasn't bad. The results agree uh, with those that we have now. Although our sigma-8 value is a little higher. We're a little higher than these uh, plots shown here. Now I want to show you why that, that sh will be of interest to, to some people in the room who care about Planck and uh, results that have come from that satellite. So perhaps, perhaps this figure has been discussed here in, in meetings. Um, this was one of the figures that, that received the most attention <clears throat> when the Planck results were released in the summer. And what it shows are the constraints on sigma-8 and omega matter from the Planck um, power spectrum, the CMB power spectrum, uh, and also from the subset of the Planck team that works on galaxy clusters, where they found galaxy clusters in the Planck survey from the SE signal and measured cosmological parameters from these. And there was a lot of fuss, a lot of attention paid to the tension uh, between these two sets of constraints. Now, there are a number of issues, uh, subtle issues that go into this. this uh, these chains here assumed that neutrino masses were zero rather than the minimal mass and shifts it down very, very slightly. But the main issue here is that this cluster analysis used a mass calibration that came from the XMM-Newton satellite. And there are significant systematic uncertainties associated with the XMM-Newton mass calibration, which were not fully accounted for in the Planck team's analysis. So what I want to show you now is how the constraints from the Planck uh, CMB power spectrum and also from the WMAP power spectrum compare with our new constraints on sigma-8 and omega matter. And that comparison is shown here. It doesn't take more than a second or two of looking at this to see that the constraints from clusters in purple and from the CMB spectrum overlap with each other very well at the 68% confidence limit. Um, that's certainly true for WMAP plus SBT plus ACT. It's also true for Planck. The constraints overlap at the 68% confidence level, although it's true that if there were any tension whatsoever, it's not in sigma-8, and it's not tension. But the preferred value is maybe a little higher for omega matter from Planck. But if people are worried about this tension between the two, I can say at least from our analysis, using our mass calibration, which is, I, hand on heart, I think is the most rigorous work in this this area that's been done so far. We know the accuracy of the work. We've got a very rigorous statistical framework that's used to do the analysis. There's no tension between the results. Okay, how about dark energy? 
So I have to admit that the chains for cluster accounts alone on dark energy were not ready for me to show you. But we had been running a parallel set of chains, uh, a, a separate analysis, MCMC chains, where we are combining the cluster counts analysis and the F-gas analysis that I showed you at the start. And those have converged enough for me to show you simply because the constraints are tighter, the same number of days on the computer have actually given us results that, that are converged. And so I can show you here, this is just clusters only, but it's cluster F-gas plus cluster counts combined. So here we've got W, the dark energy equation of state, versus omega matter. This is a flat, constant W model. And here are the constraints from clusters alone. Omega matter, consistent with the kind of numbers I was showing before. It's a bit tighter, because now we have both the F gas and the cluster counts together. Sigma 8, the constraint on sigma 8 isn't changed, because the only thing that constrains sigma 8 are the cluster counts. I already showed you that. And then the constraint on W here is really quite impressive from a single data set or a single experiment type, um, consistent again with minus one, a cosmological constant. So there's clearly a very clear detection of the effects of dark energy on these cluster data that I'm showing you here. Again, ours is not the only analysis that have done this, but there are only two other analyses that have extracted cosmological constraints, dark energy constraints rather, from the growth of clusters um, as a function of redshift. Uh, there was, the, again, the very nice work done by Alexei Verklin in here, and here's uh, his results. And more recently, with SZ-selected clusters, the result from the SPT team. So this is clusters alone, not clusters plus CMB or something else plus CMB, just clusters alone. They constrain dark energy, and although the constraints aren't quite as tight as those I showed you, they're in excellent agreement, and it's very reassuring given the completely different, completely different analysis pipelines, different ways of selecting clusters, everything agrees. Um, is consistent with, the, with each other. Uh, it's, it's really very nice. How do our constraints from combined F class plus cluster counts compare to where we were three years ago with the previous generation of analysis? That's shown here, old in gray, new in purple. You can see constraint on omega matter is a lot tighter than we had before. Um, which is nice. Again, that's that mass calibration tightening things up for us. The constraint on W isn't much better. It's pretty much the same as it was before. The reason for that is, again, the constraints on dark energy are data limited. They're limited by the fact that our survey only has so many clusters in it that go to a certain redshift. Okay, that's the limitation from the cluster counts. The survey doesn't go out far enough in redshift. F-gas, I've already talked about the limitation is there are not enough F-gas clusters. We need more. What that means, though, is that there's a straightforward way of improving these constraints quite dramatically over the next year or two, and that's just going to be extending this analysis with the same type of framework, having this low redshift end locked down, the mass calibration in there, and bringing in something like the SPT cluster sample, which extends to a redshift of one or more. We can expect this to improve quite dramatically very soon, and we're working with, the S with our SPT colleagues to make that happen now. Okay, one last results figure that I'm going to show, and it's this one, which just shows you how the results from clusters compare to the best of the rest that's out there right now. And it's an attempt to encourage you to consider using galaxy clusters when you want to ex uh, explore your cosmological parameter spaces. So again, clusters are in purple. This is counts plus F gas. BAO in brown, supernovae in green, CMB, again, this is uh, WMAP9 plus SPT plus ACD. All of the results agree with each other at one sigma. In the clusters case, again, this is a completely blind analysis, okay? It popped out the far end. They agree with each other, and we would feel very happy to bring these constraints together and see what the combined answer is, and I'm afraid we haven't had time to do it yet. So I can't show you that, but you can at least see that clusters are going to be a very useful component of that combined analysis. They are indeed the tightest, they provide the tightest constraint of any data set right now on dark energy. Okay, just a quick word about what's coming soon. What can you look out for in the next, uh, if you see one of us give a talk in the next few months, the, the new thing I didn't show you today, as well as the com final combined constraint, will be other constraints on fundamental physics, because that factor two improvement 
on the mass calibration that I told you about will have a significant knock-on effect for how well we can constrain things like neutrino masses and gravity models with these data. If you're interested in how well we could do with the old results, you can look up um, these papers here. Some of them are quite recent papers, but that's how well we could do with the old generation of analysis, this new stuff. Um, we've just started some of the chains, but uh, there's nothing I can show you right now. Okay, do I still have five minutes? Or? Okay, in the last five minutes, all I'd like to do is show a few slides talking about prospects for the next few years, and in particular, looking at, into new surveys, new cluster surveys that are coming that will contribute very significantly to the kind of stuff we're trying to do here. So we'll, we'll go through it by wavelength uh, to begin with. Firstly, on the optical front, as I'm sure most people in the room know, a large suite of very powerful optical surveys and near-infrared surveys are just beginning to come on, online now. DES, for example, has just started its program of, of observations. PanSTARS has been going for a while. Um, HSC is about to get started using the same telescope we, we worked with here, uh, Supra, um, Subaru. It's a beautiful telescope. And eventually, we're looking ahead to LSST, Euclid. These surveys will be tremendously empowering for cluster cosmology. Yes, the surveys will be useful in helping us find clusters. Um, there's no X-ray survey or SE survey that's ever been done that didn't need optical imaging as well to, to make sure it found the clusters. Uh, and you can try to do it with optical data as well. So finding the clusters, it will be very helpful. But it will be absolutely critical and no argument. You have to have it for photo Z measurements and for the weak lensing measurements that we need to calibrate the masses. So these experiments will be a critical piece of what's going on. If you're interested in this work, let, let me just advertise the LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration, uh, which is open to new members and which is looking in very hard to how to use data from these telescopes, especially this one, but the other ones together as well, to do the things we need to do in the optical part of the cluster cosmology story. Secondly, we've got millimeter wavelengths. Uh, the great thing about millimeter wavelength studies is they're a tremendously efficient way of studying the high redshift cluster of galaxy population. And projects like Planck, SPT, ACD are going to give us, they've already given us some very nice cluster catalogs. And this work will continue and grow significantly in the next few years. I have no doubt whatsoever that very soon, the combination of these millimeter wavelength surveys together with that low redshift information locked down by current X-ray and optical data is going to give us a powerful advance in our understanding of dark energy, gravity, and the like. And that work will continue ahead at pace over the rest of this decade. Um, already funded projects are looking fantastic for the future. Finally, you must have heard about this on a number of uh, occasions already with Alexi being here. But I have to mention Erosita, which is a new um, survey satellite uh, in X-rays that will fly hopefully a couple of years from now. Uh, it will perform a four-year-old sky survey, uh, two orders of magnitude deeper than RAS. You saw how powerful RAS, the Rose Adel Sky Survey, was. Two orders of magnitude deeper. Erosita will be an absolutely wonderful resource for cluster cosmology, both for finding clusters, but also, and perhaps especially, in its pointed phase for gathering mass proxy information, those M gases, L axes, T axes, Y axes for clusters. The bottom line, however, the message I really want to say to go with this is that although there's a lot of politics that gets in the way with individual experiments having their own teams, there is no one of these projects that can do the job well on its own. They have to work together. From the optical side, we have to have the photo Zs and the weak lensing information and the help with finding clusters. From the X-ray side, it'll be great at finding clusters, but you need that optical help. And the X-rays will bring that fantastic, tight mass proxy information. And the SC is our best way of finding the high redshift universe, which is great for studying the growth of structure, gravity models, uh, and, and such things at, at high redshift. We need that combination of the three wavelengths of survey. And we need to be able to get together and use the, the data together as a team. I'll also say that there is undoubtedly still a critical role for X-ray observatories, not survey instruments in this. Satellites like Chandra, XMM-Newton, will continue to provide 
critical mass proxy information, and only Chandra can really handle the high redshift universe that the SZ data will be kicking up data for. Uh, and we'll also have, I'd like to advertise Astro H. I'm a member of the team for Astro H. This will be beautiful as well from an astrophysics perspective because it will open up a brand new window on cluster astrophysics, which will help too with the cosmology by giving us a spectral resolution uh, 20, 30 times better than we've ever had before. And that will allow us to measure elemental abundances precisely and those gas velocities that I told you about before. That will perhaps... Uh, if, if we're lucky with the way nature is, allow us to improve again on the cosmological con constraints that we get. And of course, the F-gas experiment just relies on Chandra continuing to exist. Okay, my time is up. I'll just put up my conclusions. I hope I've convinced you that measurement, measurements of galaxy clusters provide powerful constraints on cosmological models comparable to the best of the other data sets that we have out there at the moment. Our standard Lambda CDM paradigm is holding up very well when confronted with these data. Um, one particular result I highlighted here today was with regard to that, in quotes, tension that had received a lot of attention recently between the Planck CMB and cluster count analyses. If you take our cluster count analyses as being the word if on, on cluster counts, your choice, of course, where you want to do that, but we see no tension whatsoever. And I know... Jan Vertlek is organizing a meeting to discuss this in, in January, so you, perhaps you'd want to invite one of our junior team members to attend. Um, the prospects for um, improvements with all these new surveys are just wonderful. Um, times are tight with funding, but there are just some fantastic surveys that are going to happen. And uh, the results are going to be impressive. They'll be competitive as, as the field move forward, moves forward. But again, just to emphasize this point, the only way that this will really work as well as it should is if all of the teams work together to exploit the mutual compatibility, the complementarity of the different experiments. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. So thanks for those beautiful results and also for highlighting how, how bright the future looks for even more. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there must be a, uh, many questions, a few questions. Uh, who wants to start? Well, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> of course. You want to you you shout at him or you want a microphone? <laughs> well, uh, whatever, you, uh, you know, you have earplugs, I'll use the microphone. The, so uh, you talked about velocities once, and I was wondering about velocity dispersions for clusters and whether the mass models that you have and the measured velocity dispersions for the clusters for which you have x-ray data and, in some cases, the uh, lensing data, whether those agree? We haven't done the test. Uh, it would be an interesting thing to do, to do because we, we do have, I'd say, more accurately than ever before, knowledge about what we think the true mean mass of that ensemble is. Right. Uh, and it would be a very interesting comparison to do. Uh, um, because, as I think you know this, this is the reason you're asking the question, there's a, been an interesting theoretical question, which, which is that we know in principle when we just do velocity dispersions from dark matter, they should be pretty good. But the difficulty is that relation between the dark matter and baryons in galaxies, and it gets messy. It's an interesting thing to do. It should be done. Yeah, I mean, we, if you we think you know the data. masses, mm -hmm. then it would be interesting to see if these things really are test part. Yeah, it, it would be very interesting for models of galaxy formation and a number of other things to do that. We don't have that many clusters here, but it's a very good thing to do. Good idea. You argued that the clusters are just big buckets that collect mm -hmm. the matter fairly from the universe, but then it didn't seem like F gas is the cosmic fraction and there is a profile for it. Yes. Uh, do we understand the physics of that quite well? Because you, you are using simulations. I don't trust simulations the way you do. Uh, <laughs> there, are lots of, <laughs> there are lots of ingredients that are not uh, modeled quite yeah. well in yeah. those simulations. For example, the star formation efficiency. I mean, often if you allow cooling of the gas, you form too yes. many stars in clusters. Yeah. And if you don't allow cooling, you get good match to the data, but then it's not physical because cooling happens. And so you need to balance cooling, but then we don't know how to balance cooling properly. 
yeah. to the level of precision that you need here. So, so why, why are these profiles there? Okay, so, so you're speaking to someone who was, who was a real skeptic as, as well, have you? I think there are a number, of, a number of issues here. So do we understand the physics? Um, I think in the way that we're using the data, uh, or for the purposes we're using it, yes, yes we do pretty well. So as I said, in, in the centers of clusters, where all of that cooling, star formation, AGN feedback stuff is going on, no, don't trust the simulations. They don't have it right. They're doing a lot better than they were five years ago, but they're not doing it right. Um, it really is getting away from that stuff. So you're getting into the regime where cooling isn't important, where AGN feedback and such things are only having a minor impact on the properties, especially because we're in these really big systems. We're working with the biggest clusters there are, so the impacts of things like AGN feedback are, are, are minimized with respect to, to other things. But the, the reason that, that I start to trust these things, at the level at least that we do now, is that the physics isn't making a very big difference. These simulations that we used are the state of the art. They are the ones with AGN feedback as well as cooling star formation in there in a way that reproduces the central regions of the clusters better than any other simulations, even though I said it's not good enough. So they're the best ones. But the real reason that I think it's okay to do this is that out here at this radius, if we go to the simplest adiabatic simulations, no cooling, no star formation, no AGN feedback, the results are consistent from those simulations with these simulations with all of that physics in. And it's just because we've gone so far away from the middle to make the measurements that most of the headaches are gone. So the systematic tolerance that I put in there, I think, is a conservative tolerance. And the adiabatic simulations come within that range. Um, I noticed with like Erosy, for instance, you said there are going to be a hundred thousand clusters, and with the measurements you discussed with Chandra, you were focusing on the most relaxed clusters for cosmology. So, what fraction of the hundred thousand, say, in Erosy, did you expect would actually be relaxed enough that they'll be useful for cosmology? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so we we have a good idea about that because. Fortunately, we've at least started to probe the high redshift universe with clusters found serendipitously in one way or, or another. Um, so what we found, searching the entire Chandra archive, is that one in eight clusters passed what was relaxed enough to make it in to our sample. Now, as the surveys expand, more higher redshift clusters will come into that. So we've probed out to a redshift of 1.1 with F gas. Most big clusters in the universe are around a redshift of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Um, it would be reasonable to expect that the fraction of clusters that would be suitable for F-gas would be lower than 1 in 8. Probably not lower than um, 1 in 20, say. It would be very surprising if it was lower than 1 in 20. And you have maybe five to 10,000 clusters that, in principle, have a big enough mass that you'd want to use them in here. So if you take one in 20 of 5,000, um, it's not hard to find a sample of 250 clusters or so. Um, it's at least 250, probably the number is, is more like 500. So your limitation won't be finding enough relaxed clusters to do a pretty phenomenal job. It'll be having... Getting the Chandra follow-up time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the problem is getting the Chandra follow-up time. So if Chandra stays working fantastically well until 2020, and we could, say, convince our Only esteemed tax... Well, that's, I like how you think. Uh, that would be a bit much. Let's, let's say we, we went along at the same level. We could get 10 megaseconds of, of time over the next six years, seven years, with Chandra. You could improve these constraints by a factor of five, with a next-generation X-ray observatory like SmartX or Athena Plus, you could observe all 250, all 500 of those things, and you'd have a test from F-gas, especially if that observatory, remember, also had very high-resolution calorimeters that measured the gas motions as well, bringing down the scatter even further. It'd be a fantastic um, probe of the expansion history. So the clusters are out there. The challenge is Chandra in the first case and then the next generation. Thanks for the observatory. Thanks, Steve, again. Thanks.